Hi right, guys, I'll try not to make it as cringeworthy as that. That's, uh, I think that's only the second time I've seen that since, the, since that happened, and that is awful for me to watch. But you can sort of see at that moment the level of emotion that, that's going on. Ultimately, Super Saturday for me um, is the crowning moment of my career to date, and something that I will never forget. But it's, it's always a hard one to sort of explain how that day went for me, and, and obviously you saw the result, but everything else around it was a bit of a blur. For me, I always have to look back over the year that, that led to that moment because ultimately you all see the accolades, you all see the, the, the good performances I had on that day, but I'd just come off of, of sort of six months, and, uh, well, six months of good performance, six months of horrific bad injuries and luck which you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemy in, in sport, I don't think. Now, 2011 probably could have been a bit of a year like that for me. We had a World Championships down in Daegu, and, and I travelled out there in fantastic shape, feeling amazing, probably jumping better than I'd ever jumped before. But sadly, I, I go into a qualification. There's a technical fault with a, uh, the, the, the pit that was being raked by some strange mechanical thing. I end up going down there jumping and tearing a hamstring quite badly. So the greatest year that could have been up until that point is completely ruined in an instant. So I then have to pick myself back up from that. And, and you guys will all know, you always have these times when things don't go, don't go well at all. And you always have to get back to it. And there's always keeping good people around you in order for that to happen. And I was very lucky. I mentioned some incredible people there in, in, in that interview at the end. I had one of the best coaches in the world. And, and, and I say that, and that's not just me saying it because I, I'd done well. I was lucky enough to have a world-renowned coach, somebody who in track and field is known to be amazing. And on top of that, I had therapists who kept putting me back together. And that was basically what happened. I kept getting injured. So I came back from this, this hamstring injury. We then travelled to South Africa. It's a terrible life, I know. Um, we hang out in South Africa for about a month training because we, we, we go there for the sun. Track and field is, is a summer sport, really. So we always like to be in the sun. And, and with my complexion, you'd think that I'd probably want to hide under a rock. But um, I actually do love the sun. And I'm very lucky that I can get a bit of a ginger tan, uh, albeit that some of the freckles connecting together. But uh, that's not particularly important. But um, no, we're, we're out in South Africa, and I'm having a, an absolutely fantastic training camp again. I'm getting into that shape that I was in the previous year. And I'm sort of starting to think now, great, I'm going to have an opportunity to show everybody that I can jump far, I can beat the best, and I'm going to have a fantastic indoor season. In a training session, we're going down, we're doing another jump session, it's going to be the last one. All of a sudden, I've done five, we go for one more, and I badly tear my hamstring again. Now, all of a sudden, I'm having this realisation that this is January of 2012, I have arguably the best opportunity of my life to really make a statement on my career and my, my life in general. I mean, the Olympics were, as you all saw, the most incredible show. And we had this realisation. This had been seven years in the making for us. We'd had it drummed into us every single day. Everything we did was about going to London 2012 and doing well. And all of a sudden, again, I'm now sitting there, badly torn hamstring. I can't walk. I'm sitting at a track that has got all of my competitors there because South Africa is a good hub for, for track and field. People go there because in January it's beautiful and hot and people like to train there. So all of a sudden, I've got everybody else looking in on me, smiling, a couple of little nudges and winks. Greg Weatherford's now hurt again. He's not going to be a challenge. Now, all of a sudden, these same people are uh, coming up to me. And, You'll be all right, mate. Don't worry. A little pat on the back and everything else. That spark of these guys knowing that basically they're being arseholes, want for a better word. <laughs> that, that was what encouraged me to then get back again. As I say, I had a fantastic team. I was very, very lucky. And the stark contrast of that is, by May, I managed to go out there in third competition out in America and then equaled the British record and, and became the world number one. And that then was the catalyst for the rest of the season for me. Now, I'd had so many things go wrong, so many. It's, it's unbelievable. If you look at the history, I mean, I had two minor medals before that at the Commonwealth Games and Europeans. But every other year, pretty much, some form of major injury would come in and ruin that for me. And it, it was heartrending. Every single time I thought I was going to do well, it would all go wrong. Now, all of a sudden, we're getting into the season of 2012, and I go to a Diamond League in Rome, and I, I, I come from, from being knocked into third place in the final round to then winning that and jumping the second longest jump of my life. And things are starting to come together. Now, things are building up in a way that always for me something has to go wrong. And a month before, we go to Madrid for a competition which is known for being fantastic for long jump. Some of the guys who were, who were in that Olympic final had been to, to that exact competition years before and jumped incredibly well. I go running, I'm against Mitch Watt, the guy you saw there, the Australian who came second. And as much as we are very, very close friends, obviously always want to beat him. I mean, there's no question. If you do sport, you want to, you want to win. Like, you're not there to, to pat your mate on the back on the day of competition, he's my worst enemy. And I'm there against him. I've got an opportunity because I think I'm going to beat him today. This is going to be that. I run down, I take off, and what do I feel? Um, 
a little electric shock in my hamstring, same one. Now this is a month before the Olympic Games. I'm meant to have one more competition in Crystal Palace after this, which for me is a, is a huge big deal. And again, I'm now in a position where I felt something in my hamstring. Now, the sort of seasoned professional that I had sort of become at that point told me to stop jumping at that point. I think if three or four years before, I would have carried on going and probably made it very, very severe. I got home, had a scan. Luckily, it wasn't too bad. But I then spent the best part of two weeks in and out of a hyperbaric chamber, which anybody who's ever done diving and, and ever had the bends, you basically have to go into a high-pressure tank, sit there and for about three hours doing absolutely nothing apart from breathe, breathing oxygen, effectively 14 metres underwater, living a very, very boring life. But these are all the things that, that you have to incorporate in order to try and get back. All of a sudden... We're a week out from the Olympic Games. We're held in Portugal. We didn't get to go to the opening ceremony and all that sort of stuff. For, for track and field athletes, you stay away and you get yourself ready for the competition. And I'm, again, I'm feeling fantastic. I'm jumping amazing. We had the best last session ever. Now, it's similar to what we've done in January, but this time, after three jumps, we walked away. We left it there. I just thought, I'm not having this hamstring come back and, and haunt me again. And then we go to the Olympic Games. Now... The first memory I have of coming into London was sitting on a coach and another name that you, you've probably heard once or twice was a certain Jessica Ennis sitting just next to me on the other side of the coach, driving along and seeing in the distance the Olympic Stadium and the Olympic Village, but also this incredibly huge skyscraper with a massive picture of her on the side there, just sort of staring at us, giving a, a sort of odd smile that, that, that she gives in, a, in the beautiful way that she does. And at that moment, you suddenly realised she's got a lot of pressure on her. I'm, I've got it easy going on here. This girl has to go into an Olympic Games with everybody already hanging the medal around her neck. I'm going in there thinking, there's a chance I can do this. I am world number one. I better get out there and, and get it done. And, and sort of seeing how people reacted showed incredibly well when they walked into the stadium. Now, on that night, on, on Saturday, August the 4th, I sort of go back to it and, and I always struggle to, to sort of draw in how it all happened because ultimately when it finished it turned into this ridiculous wave of every form of emotion that's going. But I do remember in the build up to that time I was always telling everybody because I had to believe that I was going to do well. I'd always say, well the qualification's on August the 3rd, the final's on August the 4th and when I win my gold medal I'll be there on, on August the 5th because we knew it was the next day. And that was the level of belief that I had to take going into that Olympic Stadium. So I walked out there, and in front of 82,000 people, as soon as we walked in from the tunnel, this roar of pure joy and elation from every single person. And there was somebody who was, who was there involved in that in the room. Today. I don't know if anybody else was fortunate enough to be there on, on August the 4th. But this sudden roar and pride and everything else that, that everybody who was there passed on to us was absolutely out of this world. And I, I genuinely can't be towards that level of emotion initially. And it, and it actually brought a slight tear to my eye. And, I, and I'm suddenly walking into Olympic Stadium, welling up a little bit, thinking, I haven't even started competing yet. I'm already starting to cry. I need to go and win the blooming medal first before I start doing that. So we got out there. And again, every single time any Brit did anything, the crowd just went berserk. I mean, that, to the point where Jessica Rennes took off her top. I mean, I know that's a great thing for a lot of blokes out there. But, I mean... <laughs> The way they absolutely lost it was absolutely something else. I mean, I did give a cheer as well, but it was <laughs> different reasons, I guess. Um, but it was something that truly made that Olympic Games for me, the, the way that everybody got behind you. And I think often what we, we suffer from in, in this country is people sort of putting everybody down and, and sort of not believing things are going to go well. And all of a sudden, we're in an Olympic stadium with 82,000 sports fans going absolutely out of this world. I had the incredible joy and elation of watching Jess cross that line, arms aloft, which everybody remembers, one of the most iconic images of, of that entire Olympic Games, winning that medal and knowing she was Olympic champion. About two minutes later, I then ran down the runway and jump four went, went pretty well for me. And that accumulation of what was going on just made this amazing night. And after that, I then had this incredible opportunity to stand underneath the Olympic flame and watch as Mo Farah crosses the line, taps his head, and has also become an Olympic champion. The most interesting thing at that point was, I'd said, well done to Jess, because I'd just seen my friend who we'd, been, we'd gone through the juniors together, we'd known each other a very long time, she'd just gone and won an Olympic gold medal. I then just went and did it, and then Mo went and did it. At that time, I had no idea the, the, the magnitude of, of what had just happened to everybody else. To me, I've just gone, oh, well done, Mo, 
fantastic run. I really enjoyed it. Just great. Well done. Oh, yeah. Well done. It was, it was good. Everybody else is absolutely losing the plot. Like, we've got people bouncing off the walls. There's people trying to take your clothing off you because they, they just want some level of momentum. I mean, again, fantastic. It was certain individuals doing that, but it wasn't Jess doing it, so it wasn't, a, wasn't as interesting. Um, but what, that, what I think that did and what the Olympic Games did do for us last year was truly unite a country into, into something that... It would be great if we had it all the time. We sadly don't. Again, depending on where you're from, the England team played awful the other night, and again, it's all doom and gloom. But at that moment, it was something that was so, so special... And, and I'm sort of, I guess I'm skimming over it slightly at the moment because I, I can't put into words what that moment meant for me in my life. It was something that probably will never happen again. No matter what happens in my sporting career, for sure, there will never be a moment like August the 4th, 2012 for me because the stars aligned. I didn't get a hamstring injury, which was pretty special. I did pull a hernia about three weeks later, which wasn't ideal, but luckily not on that night. Everything went well for me. I didn't know whether to laugh, cry run around, take the clothes off a bit prematurely. You, you didn't really know what to do at the moment. And, and that was that relief factor which comes with finally doing well. Finally, everything had gone right for me. After so many years of everything going wrong, I was there and I finally got crowned as, as an Olympic champion. And as I say, nothing will ever be like that again, I think, in my life, even if I go to Rio and win there. And that is the aim. I'll be going on to Rio and, and looking to, to do a repeat performance. But August the 4th, what, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. I should probably end it then. I shouldn't really, but um, but no. Ultimately, so I think the one thing that I think most people get whenever they, they speak to me about it is that I was sort of stubborn enough to sort of stick with it when everything went always always wrong for me, as it always generally does. And I was lucky on the biggest stage, the biggest moment of my life, it all went well. And because of that, I get the the luxury of coming to to speak to the likes of you guys today, which I, I am very thankful for. And Hopefully, in a few years' time, we'll go into Rio and uh, I'll be able to come back and, and have two gold medals. But I do actually have it with him as well, by request. So, pull it out of the pocket. That is the Olympic gold medal that was awarded to me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So it's a strange, it's like sort of being reunited with an old friend because I just put her in a bag and then throw her in the cabinet most of the time. So I try not to associate myself with it too much. And then you pull it out and realise and it just gives you that moment again. So I just had that moment again, which is quite nice. Um, but yeah, so I, again, that's, that sort of shows how it can go for somebody. And I think that can work in any, any walk of life and, and any person, genuinely. Just a random ginger kid from, from Bletchley that was always told it was never going to happen. And... 2012 it happened so uh, I'm pretty thankful for that and I think that's sort of something that can reflect on absolutely everybody.